You are welcome to this preview of Our Spiritual Gifts, the Fivefold Gifted Workers from Ephesians chapter 4. Our learning objectives in this session include the following. To explain a misquotation of Psalm 68, to define five kinds of gifted workers, to describe their work, and to affirm the purposes of their work. First, a structural outline of Ephesians 4, 1 through 16. This begins with an exhortation to walk worthily, explained by the fact of our unity and of Christ's great gift through his fivefold workers to equip us, to mature us, to conform us to Christ's image, and to edify us in quality and in quantity. To walk worthily, then, I, the prisoner of the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you have been called. Well, what calling was that? To interpret a phrase in any book of the New Testament, we first look to see where the phrase was introduced and what it means there. So, in chapter 1, verse 18, We were to learn what is the hope of his calling, the riches of the glory of the inheritance he has reserved for us, his holy ones. With all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, being diligent to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. What is that bond of peace? Peace between whom? Well, in Ephesians 2.15 we read, In himself, Christ, he might make the two into one new man, thus establishing peace, that is, the Messianic Jewish communities receiving Gentile believers as equal before God. Our unity then is explained in verse 4, There is one body and one spirit, just as you also were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. Well, in all whom? All human beings? No, in all those who belong to Messiah Jesus. In verses 7 and 8, To each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, it says, when he ascended on high, he led captive the captives, and he gave gifts to people. Well, when did this happen? When did Christ ascend on high? Verse 8 is apparently taken from Psalm 68, verse 18, which reads, You, Yahweh, ascended the high mount, that is, to Jerusalem, leading captives in your train, that is, spiritual and human enemies, and receiving gifts from people, that is, taking loot and distributing it among your soldiers. In this case, this was a a prediction of Yahweh in in the end times, conquering all of his enemies, and receiving their gifts. But Paul repurposes that verse, taking its language to express a more Christian understanding. When he, Christ, ascended on high into the heavens, he led captive the captives, that is, those of us who were in the underworld, taken into the heavens, and he gave gifts to people, that is, spiritual gifts to his followers as he explains in verses 9 and 10. Now this expression, he ascended, what does it mean except that he also had descended into the lower parts of the earth? He who descended is himself also he who ascended far above all the heavens, so that he might fill all things. Interpreters ask, where are the lower parts of the earth? Some explain that the earth is, is the lower parts of the heaven-earth equation. Others point out that since he ascended far above the heavens, so he must have descended 
far below the earth, that is, into the underworld, Sheol, the realm of the dead, now resurrected, ascended into heaven and over all of heaven. Thus he has given to his community on earth five kinds of workers. He gave some as apostles, some as prophets, some as evangelists, some as pastors and teachers. The Greek literally reads, He himself, it's an emphatic pronoun, gave the apostles and the prophets and the evangelists and the pastors and teachers, four classes of workers. The last two workers, pastors and teachers, seem to be closely associated, being joined by a singular plural definite article combined with the conjunction and. But being a plural, this does not say that the pastors are the teachers or that the teachers are the pastors. Rather, they work together. Let's look at the apostles for a moment. Jesus himself is our apostle and high priest from God. The twelve whom he commissioned, including Paul, were his apostles with authority. But even ordinary church planters could be called apostles or messengers sent out by churches. James seems to have been considered an apostle, though he worked in the Jerusalem church, and some couples such as Andronicus and apparently his wife Junia were regarded as apostles or those who planted churches, possibly some of the churches in Rome. But then there are also charlatans, deceitful Christians, false apostles who want authority over you and they want your money. By definition, we suggest apostles envision and work to plant new churches in neglected regions, towns, and communities in order to gather, to grow, and to multiply Christians, leaders, and gatherings. Well, the great question of theology, are there apostles today? There are two answers to this query. First, there are those who reply, no, for they all died in the first century, nor is there any need for new doctrine, hence no apostles. Then there are those who reply, well, yes, we call them mission strategists or consultants, church planters, movement leaders, missionaries or missionaries. Prophets then, regarding prophets, we have the example in the New Testament of a prophet named Agabus, who was able to say, Thus saith the Holy Spirit, and to give a message from God. At Antioch, certain church leaders were called prophets working alongside teachers. In the first century, prophets had a foundational ministry alongside that of apostles. Prophets were known to reveal new doctrines from God, especially concerning the mystery about Christ and his relation to the church made up of both Jews and Gentiles. Prophets worked primarily in churches, speaking and weighing each other's messages, and were instructed by the apostle to do all things in an orderly manner, each prophet remaining subject to each other. By definition, then, prophets receive and declare truth about God, his will, his work, his promises, and his warnings in order to bring others in obedience to him. Well, are there prophets today? Some theologians reply, no, for we now have the New Testament scriptures, so there's no need for prophets. Others reply, of course there are. We call them preachers, apologists, exhorters, defenders of the faith. Evangelists in the first century included Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Philip was called an evangelist, and so was Timothy. Peter reminded his followers that God had chosen him to be the first to evangelize Jews and also the first Gentiles. And Paul said he was ready to testify 
to the gospel of God's grace, literally, to evangelize. The role of the evangelist, then, is to father new believers. We define evangelists as those who speak and write about Messiah Jesus, his life, his teaching, his death, his resurrection, and his promises in order to bring others to faith in him. Well, we can also ask, are there evangelists today? Well, some would say, well, no, for we now have the four canonical gospels or evangels. No more evangelists are needed. But then others reply, well, yes, we call them soul winners, street preachers, Jesus freaks, fishermen, and sometimes even evangelists. Pastors is a Latin term for shepherd. Jesus is the great shepherd. Jesus is said to have had compassion on those who were as a flock without a shepherd. He called himself the good shepherd. Hebrews calls him the great shepherd over many others. And he is definitely the guardian or pastor of souls. Elders and overseers were told to pastor the church. And elders were told to shepherd the flock, not for salary nor for prestige, but to do so willingly. Some, of course, who do so very well may be paid in order to devote themselves to the work. So, we try to define pastors as those who teach, exhort, counsel, reprove and comfort Christians, serving as models, coordinating the exercise of spiritual gifts in gatherings in order to guard and to grow flocks, that is, believers, in quality and in quantity. Well, are there any pastors today? Some reply, no, for we now have qualified clergy who implement denominational rules and policies. What else do you need? But others reply, well, yes, of course we have pastors. We call them elders or group shepherds, counselors, facilitators, trainers, and maybe even pastors. Well, then we have teachers. Jesus said, you call me a teacher and you're right, for so I am. In Antioch, there were both teachers and prophets leading the church. The scripture said that God has established in the churches first apostles, then prophets, and, and thirdly, teachers. However, however, churches are sometimes plagued with commercial prophets who seek to tickle ears, that is, only to tell others what they want to hear for pay. Paul considered himself a preacher, an apostle, and a teacher. The content communicated by teachers builds faith by communicating truth. The book of Hebrews said that all mature Christians ought to become teachers, whereas James warned that not many of you should be teachers. There are also false teachers. You can recognize these by the way in which they cause heresies, splits, or divisions within your church. So, teachers read, interpret, explain, and proclaim the scriptures to others in order to inform their mind, to strengthen their faith, and to motivate them to obey Jesus' commandments. Are there any teachers today? Some reply, no for we now have systematic theology and a statement of faith which we can consult. But others insist, yes, we have teachers. We call them teaching elders, pulpiteers, classroom instructors, Bible scholars, and even discovery Bible study leaders in new little churches. Well, what do they do? They equip us. They are given for the equipping of us, the saints, for the work of ministry, and for building up us, the body of Christ. They mature us until we all attain unto the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a mature man, to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ, both Jew and Gentile. They conform us. As a result, we are no longer to be children, tossed here and there by waves, 
or carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of people, by craftiness in deceitful scheming, but speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in all aspects into him who is the head, that is, Christ. And they edify us, <clears throat> from whom the whole body, being fitted and held together by what every joint supplies, according to the proper working of each individual part, causes the growth of the body for the building up of itself in love. The fivefold workers cooperate in mission for the planting and multiplication of new believers, of disciples, of new churches and leaders within those churches. In the next session, we hope to describe the speaking gifts. Please read ahead in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, paying a particular attention to prophecy, teaching, exhorting, the word of wisdom, and the word of knowledge.